Hello, this is Patrick. Am I the right person? Hey, you are. <laughs> hey, good. All right. The right Patrick. So, right. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I want to um, get real clear, and hopefully I'm recording this so I do, or I'll go into your files. Um, so yesterday we were having a discussion, and I what I did was call projection. In other words, my reality is my reality, and I just put it out there to somebody else made me mad or frustrated or whatever. And then I caught it and you caught it and said, ah, it's denial. And then you explained 35 years of work to me. And I said, we please go back to that again. And what I know is, is that anybody who's taken your work and tried to simplify it has messed it up. So let's go from there. So I'll, and I'll ask some questions along the way about um, What's the difference between projection and denial? First. Okay, good question. I think a starting point for the question is probably let's um, let's get clear on the whole idea of when I say I see something or something does this, that we're looking at a construct of the mind, a thing called perception. You know, we've all been taught that we have eyes. And we see out through our eyes what's happening out there. And that's a total fraud. You know, the eye, when you look at the eye scientifically, it is a one-way valve. Information comes into it. It's an antenna that picks up light frequencies. But you can't see out of the antenna. You know, and, you know your TV antenna picks up frequencies. You can't look up through those wires and see out through the TV antenna any more than you can see out through your eyes. But we've been taught, you know, just like we've been taught that the sun rises every the sun never rose, it never will rise, it can't rise, it's not what happens. The earth moves around and and wow, there's the sun. So so we're taught fantasies and some of our fantasies are useful. You know, sun rises at six o'clock, well it's good, I'm gonna get up in the morning, it's a good fantasy, but it's not true. But a really destructive fantasy is one that has me believe that when I look at something, I'm looking out through my eyes. When I say I see something, what's really happening is light energy comes into the eye, causes brain cells to fire, resonates something in me, and my mind generates a thing called perception. It's a construct of my mind. And what I see is an image generated by my brain, an image that is interior to me, belongs only to me. If you've ever been in an accident or at, at a, in a courtroom where they're talking about an accident, and there were six different people about the, in the accident or witnesses to the accident, you'll notice that no two of them have the same perception, the same construct in their minds about the accident. So perception is the output of the mind. And it's a construct that's unique and individual to each person interesting there's a cia link that we have on our website where the cia comes to that precise conclusion after millions of dollars spent in researching human intelligence and there's a whole chapter in the book you can download it free from cia.gov a whole chapter in the book about perception and their bottom line conclusion is the mind does not record reality the mind generates reality So when I'm looking at a reality, I'm looking at something generated by my mind. There's something moving in me that produces a picture. Now, my picture may be accurate, which means my perception is quite well uh, grounded in what's actually happening. Or my perception may be very poor and does, it doesn't even, it hardly even relates to what's actually happening in the world. And when I think or speak as though something outside of me is the cause of what's happening inside of me, we define that in this work as denial. So when I say, you made me mad. Now, you know, if I'm honest with myself, you know, decades before I met you, I knew what this mad was about. But We've been taught in this culture to blame everybody else for what's happening inside of us. So there's a whole language and belief system that something else makes us feel, something else that makes us 
see things a certain way. So when I say, you make me mad, you make me sad, you make me afraid, you hurt me, I'm lying to myself. If I'm mad, mad is a condition in my own mind generated by my mind. If you trigger it into activity, it's accurate for me to say, oh, what you said brought up anger for me. But when I lie to myself and I say, what you said made me mad, what happens is, and if, if I don't like the mad that I'm experiencing and I want to change it, and I believe that you made me mad, then I have to somehow change you. When I realize that my mad is a product of my own internally constructed perception, and then I start to tell myself the truth, oh, what you said brought up anger for me, given my mind permission to show me that my anger, my sadness, my fear, whatever it is, belongs to me and is not caused by you. So when I enter into denial, and again, our definition is when I think or speak as though something outside of me is the cause of something inside of me, I'm in denial. What denial does is it causes me to dissociate from the cause of whatever it is that I'm describing, my mad, my sad, my afraid, whatever it is. In order to hallucinate, in order to generate a perceptual construct that shows me that you're the cause of my mad, I have to hide the cause of my mad from me. And I say to myself, boy, I never want to be mad like that again. And boy, I'm going to change you so you never make me mad again. I go deeper and deeper into denial and I go deeper and deeper into hiding the cause of my anger. And therefore, my re anger becomes, my sadness, my grief, whatever it is, becomes unresolvable because I've hidden it so deeply. Now, it's kind of like, uh, you know, creating a document on your computer, putting a password on the document, and closing down the file and throwing away the password. Am I ever going to get to that document that I want to edit again if I don't have the password? No. Denial is like putting a password, and I don't know what the password is, and now I can't change whatever it is that I'm in denial about. So when I deny, I dissociate. When I dissociate, I literally strengthen the energy in me of whatever it is I'm dissociating from. So when I say, you made me mad, I have to push I have to hide the root of my anger deeply inside myself in order to believe this hallucination that you're the cause of me being mad. So my dissociation gets deeper and deeper and deeper with each denial. And the more I push on that, the more energy I put behind denying something, the more amplitude there is behind that something. And amplitude is what strengthens energy waves. You know, you've heard me talk before about Marcel Vogel, who was a 23-year senior scientist from IBM, who brought to a global science conference I was keynoting at about 40 years ago, brought a thing called the Delaware camera. And with that camera, he could take a picture of the high energy waves that leave the mind when we think a thought. So if I'm in denial of my anger, I strengthen it. And with this camera... Marcel would be able to take a picture of that wave. If I deny it again, somebody else comes along and, you know, really activates my anger. I go, no, you just, you really, boom. I push it down another level. I put more energy into it. And literally the energy wave that Marcel's camera would see would be stronger than it was a moment ago. So the more I live in denial, the more I intensify this energy wave. And the fact that we live in a world of resonance means that every energy wave that I send out is going to tend to draw behavior out of people who have similar energy patterns in them. And so the more I deny my anger, the more I'm sending out a high energy wave. And the message that goes out for me is, hey, world, I have all this anger I'm hiding from myself. It's a disease, and I need somebody to show me my anger. Well, somebody's going to show up that's going to resonate my anger. But here's what happens when I live in denial and dissociation. If Bill shows up and resonates my anger, I'm – dissociated from anger, which means I have no direct contact with it. So now 
I take that anger content and I build my perception of Bill out of it. So I project the content of my dissociated mind into my brain's image of Bill, and Bill shows up in my mind with my anger attached, and I swear that it must be his anger because, after all, I can see that it's his. My perception shows me a picture that verifies that my lie is true. Now, the culture teaches that projection, generally speaking, the culture teaches that projection is taking something that's inside of you and putting it outside of you. That's not projection. That's externalization. Projection is what happens when certain brain cells fire in me and I project the content of those brain cells into my perceptual construct, into my brain's image of you. So my mind will verify my lie because it will show me pictures that you're the cause of my anger. And until I get the password to that dissociated content, I can never clean it up. So I'm going to find relationship after relationship after relationship after relationship where somebody, quote, unquote, makes me angry. It's actually a book about that. It's a pretty good read. It's called Why Is This Happening to Me Again? <laughs> you can read it on our website for free. So what's the password? The password is forgiveness. To every dissociated thought, the password is forgiveness. When I apply forgiveness, what happens with the forgiveness process? And, you know, this is the part you're referring to that I mentioned took me 35 years of working full-time with the Aramaic forgiveness process to understand it. Forgiveness collapses perception. Forgiveness recognizes, first century Aramaic forgiveness recognizes that perception is a construct and it's driven by goals. And in Aramaic, the word forgive is shebag, which literally translates to cancel. So when I take a goal that's driving my perception, i.e., I want to blame everybody in the world for my anger, and you do something that resonates my anger, my goal causes my mind to reach into my dissociated anger, build a picture of you, and you're the one with the problem. When I cancel the goal, when I look, locate the goal that's driving that errant perception, and the goal is, gee, Patrick, I want you to walk on eggshells around me. When I cancel the goal for you to walk on eggshells around me, I cancel the goal for you never to confront me on anything that's true, whatever the goal is, what happens is that being the driver of my perception, it causes my perception to collapse. You know, if you think about the uh, the 9-11 event, we watched a, a total, complete, physical impossibility happen. We watched a building made of steel collapse at free fall speed on its own footprint, right into its own footprint. Now, it's a whole other conversation to recognize that that is not physiologically possible, physically possible under the laws of physics. But that's a different conversation. But if you think about that building, that tower collapsing in on itself, when I key into the goal that's really driving my errant perceptual construct, that's driving me to project something that's inside of me into my brain's image of you, when I locate that goal and I cancel it, what happens is that perception collapses in on its own footprint. And its own footprint is the root that I've dissociated from in myself. And so when I cancel that goal, I have the opportunity to go to the root of my pained perception. I bring it forward in the presence of active love and the pain that I've been dissociating from begins to dissipate, begins to fall apart and heal. And as a result of forgiveness, I free from my, myself from my own dissociated content. So if you remember in the Why Is This Happening to Me Again workshop in the intensive, I, I write at the top of the board, deny, then move forward and talk about dissociation and then projection. How do I end projection through forgiveness? So that would be the, the difference between denial and projection and how the whole cycle works. And why one would do the absolutely ridiculous thing of canceling a perfectly good goal that one holds for someone. 
and uh, which which really usually leads people to another question that is well why would i cancel a perfectly good goal all i want is for that person to treat me lovingly gently and with respect isn't that a good goal michael you know that's a really awesome goal i agree with it but and i would never suggest you cancel that goal because there's something wrong with the goal but if you load that goal into your mind and when you load it, it accesses something based in hostility or fear, I would suggest you cancel that perfectly beautiful, wonderful goal every time it resonates hostility or fear because every time you load it in your mind and you cancel it, you get another opportunity to drop into the hidden part of the mind and clean out that part of the mind, the, the next hidden part, the next hidden part. And those hidden parts of the mind are the things that show up in our physiology as our diseases. So does that resonate any other thoughts or questions for you? Is that, does that get to uh, where you were looking to go, Patrick? Hi, do I unmute? You are unmuted. I, loud and clear. Okay. <laughs> um, it's like um, it doesn't bring up any questions. It brings up the only question is how much can I review and study and, and then start speaking. I think the main thing for me is that I have to adapt to others or to be lazy. I've been speaking in the normal language of the land, which is backwards, and not claiming each and every time anything bothers me. I haven't spoken the words. I think it's very important for me to speak the words properly. Uh, you claim when you do this, I do this. You know, it brings up this for me. That's the maximum. But even that um, tends to make people feel that they did something wrong. They don't. Most people. That's the biggest thing. Of course, I that's say. another nobody, denial. Nobody wants to be wrong. What? Yeah, but notice, notice that's another denial. To believe what I just said. You, you say, and that. That okay. makes what people feel wrong. <laughs> that makes people feel like they're wrong. So, so once again, there's the denial, the belief that something outside causes something inside to happen. So if I say something that asks you to be accountable and you go into feeling wrong or bad, that's your opportunity to heal the part of your mind that probably goes back to ancient history of being told you're wrong or you're bad. Right. Another forgiveness process. And our whole culture, here's I mean, the, here's literally the thing, our whole think, culture is built on this for me, lie. Yeah, I'm just saying um, that I want to take 100% responsibility and influence others. But if I'm pushing their buttons all the time, even by saying the truth, you know, when you do this, uh, it brings up my stuff, you know, and then they get their button pushed. Well, we're back in, you know, garbage land, and they don't learn anything, and I don't get any more work. So I thought I would just, like, keep it to myself <laughs> or say it occasionally, but not – I don't know. It's kind of hard. Well, you know, there's an old story about yeah, John the Baptist. <clears throat> and if you remember that story, John the Baptist told the king and queen something that they didn't want to hear, that they were in denial about. Right. And he, they literally removed his head. And and right. that's what happens in our culture of denial is virtually everybody believes that everybody else is the cause of what's going on inside of them. You know, back when I was uh, writing Why Is This Happening to Me Again originally, I spent uh, several days at a large bookstore. I don't remember if it was a Barnes & Noble or you know, one of the big bookstores. And I was going to and I was just reading different books from psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, theologians, people who'd written about forgiveness. And virtually everybody, every one of those books, sooner or later, the person who's writing it asks the client, you know, they're describing a client interaction, and they ask their client, well, how did that make you feel? And that question is rooted in the basic error of the culture. Nothing can make anybody feel anything. But it can sure show us what's inside of us when events happen. And, yes, the belief that somebody else is the cause 
of what's going on inside leads people to want to take off other people's heads. So, you know, if you're going to play John the Baptist, you got to, there are two skills that John the Baptist did not have that he really needed to develop before he told the king and queen what he told them. And that was he needed to know when to duck and when to hold the mirror up. <laughs> and, yeah, if you've got people who live in deep denial, if you're really, you know, you've got to know when to duck and when to hold the mirror up, or it can be best to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> well, in my personal relationships, we're progressing right along um, and getting better and better and better. Uh, get our buttons pushed plenty, you know. And we're just, I'm, it's like, um, you know, somebody else doesn't want me to teach and preach, and, you know, I just figure it's my job to take care of my and other and set an example. Plus, I don't want to be ducking all the time. I'm with you on that. Stress. <laughs> I'm with you uh, on that. The other thought well, that it brings up for me is, go ahead. I was going to say, when you when you say, uh, you know, I don't want to bring um, you know, do stress or cause somebody else to have Alzheimer's, the thing that would cause somebody else to have Alzheimer's is what they've dissociated from in their own mind. It wouldn't be any behavior that you would do. But, but... There may be lots of blame if you're the one who triggers people's stress and they don't want to deal with it. Right. It's kind of like, you know, as I see it, it, it's kind of like the universe, the creator, doesn't like to see us diseased. And and so, his, mm-hmm. you know, in essence, has said, I have set the world up so that if you're holding on to any disease energy in you, somebody's going to come and show it to you. You're probably not going to like it when it happens. But somebody's going to show up that will show you your disease. If you step into responsibility and understand forgiveness, then you'll see that person as a gift because when you stop and you go, oh, this is mine, this is my stress, this is my pain, then you have the opportunity to change it. It's a huge gift. But again, the whole culture is so stuck on it's all somebody else's fault that that can be a challenging thing to get across to someone. <laughs> yeah, that's it's probably right. the biggest cause of divorce there is in the world. It's uh, yeah, I think it is, or even just dry, dead relationships where they don't get divorced because they've been together for a long time and want to not screw up their finances in their old age or something. But they don't have any. Yep. Yep. They don't have any but life in them because they don't have any love in them. <laughs> yep. What? That's it. Yeah. Well, and that is, in fact, divorce. You know, I, I've worked with lots of people over the years that, you know, oh, probably divorce. after the first two two years they were together, they divorced, but they lived under the same roof and pretended they were married for the next 50 years. Uh, that's, uh, yeah. that's what the majority seems. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it'd be interesting to see how this goes with people. Um, I will be counseling people online. And I'll ask, who would like to try this? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> you got some heavy-duty stuff that keeps repeating. Would you like to learn about this? Patrick, I know you've got a full set of the DVDs, and you might want to, in the context of this conversation, you might want to watch the DVD communication. Did you hear what I think I said? <laughs> I'll do it. There's a powerful resolution in that video. Tell me how far off this cosmology I have of my own is. My perception or projection or whatever it is, um, is that the whole thing turns on survival. And the other thing that you're saying on that is, um, second, the major thing on that is is that uh, people have a backwards language of projection and non-responsibility. And the whole whole in the whole world probably i don't know if there's any country that has it differently you know if there's anybody that speaks responsibly for their realities that would be interesting to know if there was one um, it would anyway i just perceive that um people that people like when they're little kids they start out and they say well i'd like you to disappear same thing as you know what people do when they kill in the military, et cetera. But it's like, 
I just want to kill you. I want you to go away. I want you to disappear because I think you're hurting me. And therefore, you're the enemy. So let's take you out. So what I notice is that in arguments and conversations that people have that are stressful, and I call it the blame game. And people just want to play the blame game. Um, or I have plenty, plenty, still do. And then, you know, hopefully I can get a handle on it and get back to myself. But the survival that's the physical survival of the human body or the flesh self, people call it, that are Christian oriented, that um, the same thing for the emotions. The emotional self, however it believes, whatever it believes to be true, says, well, this is me. I'm identified with these beliefs. And therefore, when you present something different, you made me wrong. Well, you just, in essence, have attacked me. You have killed me. You're trying to kill me. So I'm going to jump in there and defend myself by trying to kill you, by making you wrong, by raising my voice, by attacking you, as I feel that I've been attacked. And I always feel that or think that the final resolution as we go through this would be the thing that, like, I'm, a, I'm basically – study all world religions and see the common denominator, except for when they lose their love in it. But the common denominator is love in everyone. But what Christ spoke, what he did, call myself a Jesus said Christian, but I also realized what he did is what he spoke even louder. So what he did was he forgave everybody when he hung on the cross and blamed nobody and said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And oh, he wait, said well, something well, close well, to well, that well, in other well, languages. Can I, can I, can I, can I interrupt okay. you there? You're going to tell me what he really said? <laughs> well, no, no, no. Just to well, let me just make one statement that. and then go ahead and okay. add to it. Go for it. The statement is, I don't see where he had any hate energy. It was all love energy, just like sunshine, just like the sun, you know, it's like, and God, good. It's energy for everybody forever and ever. It's love. It's life. So it's love and light and life. And it just keeps on coming, whether you're good or bad. But we all deny it when we feel that we're bad. Some bad people don't feel that way, so they don't deny it. And they feel better than people who feel guilty and hurt themselves because they feel bad at themselves and deny the flow of love or energy or circulation of blood in their body. It's all one thing, same thing, different levels. So I think to me he demonstrated that um, the final resolution is no defense whatsoever. No attack, no defense. No belief in death is the final resolution. Something like that. I can't say it quite right, but that's around about how I'm thinking. So the, the one so that opens up the one piece what's your thoughts? The one piece that uh that I would uh, just do a little bit of a slip around on is that he forgave everybody. My offering is that he never forgave anybody for anything and he never suggested forgiving anybody for anything. And that that's, that's the Greek idea of pardoning. And that's about letting somebody else Uh off the hook for what's happening inside of me. And that's what's become forgiveness in our Western world. Our Greek philosophical world tells us, well, you just let everybody off the hook, you forgive them and then you'll be okay. But what he taught was to go inside yourself and remove hostility and fear. And I would offer, you know, you're a naturopath. And as a naturopath, what what do you suppose? If you knew that you were going to face your death, cancel the thought this weekend through torture and crucifixion. And you knew that you had in your structure generations of death because everybody in your bloodline over 120 was already dead. And you were going to go in and detoxify that. What would the healing crisis look like? Do you suppose that if you went into the Garden of Gethsemane, you took some friends with you who were there to hold the space of love for you, although they couldn't process death and you went out to them and they had gone asleep, they'd gone unconscious, can't you even stay awake for an hour? What do you suppose detoxing generations and generations and generations of death and fear and anger and sadness and guilt and grief would look like? Do you suppose it might look like if you're going to forgive all of that, the healing crisis might look like sweating blood. And we're told that's exactly yeah, what too. he did. And then he huh. comes out and he comes out and, and here's the high priest servant who's going to have him mercilessly slaughtered. 
And Peter raises his sword to, you know, take off the high priest servant's head. He's going to attack. He's going to do the world myth thing of the good guy kills the bad guy and becomes the hero. Yeshua stops him, right. and then he functions like a human being. He functions as love because there's nothing in him to be forgiven. He totally, completely functions as love, and he simply reaches out and heals the man who's going to have him mercilessly slaughtered. And, you know, he's instructed people earlier to be the space of love for those who hate you, do good to those who despitefully use you. And he demonstrates doing that. And so much of the world has taken an errant message out of it and said, ah, you see, the power of suffering, that's what did it. No, he came to show us the power of functioning as love, as a human being, in the face of the arch enemy, the high priest servant. He healed him. He did what humans do. That's what he demonstrated to us, was the power of functioning as active present love, not the power of suffering and death. But, right. you know, everything's got a reality. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, what I'm feeling really lucky at this point was that a lot of me was adapting to not not being in this truth, not being in my truth, uh, adapting to all the other people that I'm speaking to and doing things with. And um, I think that's probably all about just being accepted. And also, in my mind anyway, it was about not hurting them on their path, not destroying anything that they're up to. So... You know, their past, their choice. So who am I to fear with it? You know, it's free will. So I will be, but for me, I don't know about that end of it, but for me, I know that I have now made the decision that I will stick with this and stick with love and skip the projection and the denial until it comes up and then I'll deal with it. And then I'll help other people do the same. I'm here to hold the space for that, my friend. Moving around about it. <laughs> it's a powerful gift to give. Uh, you just need to make sure you keep your head attached. Yeah, true. Oh, <laughs> not to just be asking for volunteers. <laughs> you like to volunteer to learn this opposite language of everything. Um, there it is. Well, something. I don't know. I forgot what it was. I had a question, but I don't know what it was. Huh. Oh, yeah. You made an offering that you said, uh, here's an offering. You might want to take me up on it. And I say, yes, but I'd like you to go back through that offering again of removing anything that's in me that has to do with that in your words. Uh, I'm not sure clear. I heard the question. Can you reword that so I get it a little clearer? Uh, get, being committed, taking the offering of removing anything within me that's of death, that creates death for me or others. Anything of death. Removing I'm with it. you. Anything that's not supporting eternal life. Yeah, ultimately, that's our task, is to literally face everything in our genes, everything in our generations that doesn't come from the space of active present love, remove that, forgive that, and then there's nothing left in physiology to kill us. You know, if you listen to Yeshua in, in the book of Revelations, he talks about overcoming, and what are we overcoming but this whole blame game, the, the game of the world of blaming everybody else and taking responsibility. And he says, to he that overcomes, he will not taste of the second death. He will become a pillar in the temple of my God. The temple is the body. He will become a pillar and shall go out no more. That's a pretty clear promise that we'll stop killing ourselves. And I'd offer that all death is suicide. We do it to ourselves, and we're trained by the culture to do that. Hmm. 
So one of the ideas of this work and one of the ideas of this radio show is to bring forward a whole community, a global community of people who are willing to face everything based in any form of dis-ease energy, anything formed of any form of hostility or fear, remove it and stand literally in the space where this eternal energy system called the body my unit lives eternally. It's not designed to die. It dies because we dissociate from the dis-ease energies that never belong. I mean, it's interesting if you go back and look at the Aramaic word sin, the word sin is an archery term. You fire at the target, you miss the bullseye, score your PL sin, you're off the mark. It's not some identity we should be taking on. It's just saying here, if you engage, and this is one of the reasons I think why people have, you know, have bought into this, you know, you're blaming them. If you show them, if you reflect to them their sin, if you reflect the energy that's off the mark that they're engaging in, they've been taught to believe that they're being blamed rather than going, oh, I never realized that was a dis-ease energy I was holding on to. Thanks for pointing out to me. I'm willing to be free of all of that. Mm -hmm. And each step that one takes in doing that is another step toward literally fulfilling that promise of, literal eternal eternal physiological existence so here you hear lots of people talking about eternal life but but you got to die first it's like, that's not what he said he didn't say <laughs> eternal life after you die he said eternal eternal life means death is not in the in the program but that's a hard one for people's minds to let go of when everybody they know over 120 is dead <laughs> it's pretty convincing and like Einstein said, re- illu- or pardon me, reality is an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. <laughs> Notice death is a pretty persistent <laughs> illusion. <laughs> so let's create a community of people that shows it's possible. That's what I'm here for. And, of course, you know, everybody in my bloodline over 120 is dead. So will I make it? I don't know. But I'm committed to facing everything based in any form of hostility or fear in me and being responsible for it and processing it out, forgiving it, removing it, and stepping forward into life in deeper and deeper ways. And if you listen to Yeshua, the single thing that he said he came to do, he said, I come to bring you life and bring it more abundantly. (laughs) Yay, for sure. Joining you in it, my friend. Uh, uh. There was a, a technique given through my wife's guys where, um, and it brought me to a realization, it doesn't complete the forgiveness process, but it brings love present as the person is con- presently thinking. Then you can, then it's easier. Then it brings love present, which is very important. So it's unconditional love for oneself. And um, then after that, I think it's a lot easier to, dig down in. I haven't experimented. It helped me a lot to realize what was underneath. But on the first level, say you're playing the blame game, and then you could say, do some tapping here and there. Usually it's in my heart center area. <laughs> Sometimes it's throat, but just tap away and say, even though so-and-so and so are, you know, even though I'm a total, you know, I'm an asshole, um, I love, honor, cherish, and accept myself. And it could be the projection or the denial that it's someone else. It could be, you know, that I am it, that I'm saying I'm it. It uh, doesn't matter. But then um, it releases the hold of not having love for oneself in that moment pretty quickly, usually within uh, 60 seconds to three minutes. Most everything's alleviated and love's present. So then experiment with the scene of that, which I never figured whether that was counter to your work or aided to your work or whatever. So I'm going to find out if AIDS going to the next level of, you know, perceiving what's in oneself and letting it go. 
Yeah, my take is that, you know, tapping can be a powerful way to simply open blockages in the energy field and help things to move through. And so if there's something less than love that's blocking one being aware of oneself as love, and and remember that this isn't about loving yourself or loving anybody else. Once we move into, you know, I love you or my job is to love you, I just totally blew the whole game because I just stepped outside of language that represents truth. Nobody can love you. Right. You can't love anybody. You never have. I never have. Nobody's ever going to love anybody. And, and the creator doesn't love us because love isn't a verb. It's not something we do to each other. It's what we are. And so the, the goal is to function as love, not to love someone. When we turn it into a verb, we make the goal uh, a goal that becomes non, that can't be accomplished. Because when you recognize right. that, the universe is set up to bring to you someone to show you what is less than loving you. If somebody tells you this lie that this man Yeshua said, you're supposed to love your neighbor, that's a great idea. Not represented in his original Aramaic words. But if somebody tells you you're supposed to love this person, so now I think love is a verb. It's something I'm supposed to do to them. They come along and resonate my rage, and up comes my rage. Now what have I got? I've got a perfect formula for guilt. Oh, I was supposed to love my neighbor, and I went into rage at them. Oh, look how bad, and and now another whole downward cycle happens. Whereas when I realize that love is a state of being, it's what I am, and my goal is to hold love present, even if my neighbor comes along and resonates my rage. Now I've got a goal I can accomplish. I can keep bringing love present to my rage, to my sadness, to my guilt, to my neighbor that I've blamed. And when I stand as the presence of love, I'm now achieving what the man said was possible. And I have life more abundantly in that moment where my rage is in my face. But now I've stepped in instead of getting lost in my rage, I've stepped into a place where I'm processing through my rage by holding love present. It's like love is the master solvent, dissolves the rage, the fear, the sadness, and leads to the ability to, as he said, overcome. 